Welcome everyone to today's podcast. Today we're talking with Bill Sheeb. Bill is a technical storyteller who specializes in helping companies tell compelling stories about their technical products, which are used to build brand awareness and close more deals. I met Bill after he attended a webinar about marketing in the groundwater industry that I hosted for the National Groundwater Association last month. When I saw his title as a technical storyteller, I was immediately interested in knowing more about what that meant. After speaking on the phone with Bill, I realized that he had a lot to talk about when it comes to groundwater, geology, energy, and I thought it would be fun to record a conversation and put it out there for you to listen to. So Bill, thank you for joining me today. Well, it's good to be here, Chuck. Thank you for offering this opportunity to me. Absolutely. So Bill, you're based in Fort, Col Fort Collins, Colorado, but you work with clients all over the country, right? Mainly in the West, but okay. yeah, I'm available to work with clients anywhere. Okay. And you're a technical storyteller. So what exactly is a technical storyteller and who is that for? Well, in my mind, it's, a, it's more of a marketing thing for companies that are offering or selling technical products. Most of what I see out there tends to be uh, technical reports that people put up on their websites or send out. And that's good. But it's not good from a marketing standpoint to pull people in. They already have to arrive kind of with a heavy interest in what you're offering, you know, and if they're already looking at two or three choices of product or the type of service they need, they're very easily lost. They won't follow through. So a technical storyteller uh, tries to not dumb it down, but put it more on a personal level. I think of it, I think of it as some of the things that have influenced me the most working when I was working as a hydrogeologist, mainly in the consulting and mining business was, uh, some of the best talks you had to convince people to do things or to learn about a new product is you're talking with somebody out at a mine site on top of a giant lump of dirt, <laughs> you know, and that's when people like, Oh yeah, I, uh, I work with that company and they, you know, they did this and that I was really happy with this. And you really find out more what you need. You, you can ask technical questions without getting so much into having to interpret the numbers. You know, you all know what kind of numbers, you know, what, what are those numbers supposed to mean? And they say, yeah, it, it handles that. It's, it has that level of sensitivity or, you know. So technical storytelling is, in my mind, very similar to, it's, it's working off of traditional white papers and case studies, but setting them up on, a, on an introductory level for someone first coming to see your product or something to get a feel for what's going on before you hit them with all the, the technical stuff. And in particular, it's a, it's a challenge because I have three different science degrees and, and they certainly do not teach you how to tell a story. They teach you how to give very bland, you know, just don't, don't even try and convince anybody of anything. Obviously your facts will, will convince anybody, you know, and that's not really true. So, so that's where I'm trying to fit in. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, you know, people definitely understand things in like a narrative fashion, especially when it comes to buying something, you know, you don't want to just know the technical details, but you want to know what it's going to do for you. And that's a good way to show somebody that is to tell them a story about someone else where they can put themselves into the story. Is that kind of the angle that you're trying to take? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people that you're hoping to watch this, at least in the, in the groundwater industry, are going to have a different sort of, not going to have a marketing background. I think you mentioned to me in a former call that uh, there's a lot of word of mouth. So, but in marketing parlance, it would be called your, your uh, value proposition. Not just what you do, but why should anybody care? What's, what's the value to them of what you're doing? Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's communicated through the, the telling of the story. Through, through the telling of the story, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, in particular, I see a difference between written and web copy. Uh, on the web, you need the story even more. And you have many more options than that in terms of being able to add visuals to illustrate what you're talking about and pull people in more. Whereas on a, a written white paper, say, you're constrained. You know, it's going to be printed, but what right there? So should we make it long? Should we make it short? Um, should we add, is this the visual we want? Because we can't have two of them because that'll fill up too much of the page, you know. Mm -hmm. 
little things like that. So I think it's interesting moving this stuff onto the web. Also, there's the question, who are you writing these things for? So in a story, you can bring in more people. If you're uh, doing it in a more traditional way, you're going to need to write more stuff because it depends. The same project may require that you need first probably there's somebody on the technical side on the other end that said we need we need a number five gidget to make this work who sells those and they go down to a quarter inch mm -hmm. and uh so he goes to his boss and maybe his boss goes yeah we should get one of those gidgets i'll pass it upstairs to get purchase approval well now you're starting to move into people they they really don't care about the widget the guy down that they didn't even met said this will work fine but what about purchasing it? They're looking at like, so, I mean, I've been out in the field for a while in uh, Northern Nevada. And I remember I was working with a, we had two two man crews that alternated. So we're talking on all these uh, phone calls. We didn't have Zoom, we didn't have that level of luxury. And, uh, and we got really into the whole idea, you know, instead of sticking, instead of sticking tapes down to measure the well, the depth of water, how was the technology going in terms of using sounders to go ahead and just do it that way? Um, and there was a lot, there was a lot of talk, a lot of time wasted that we charge money for. <laughs> and really what it came down to was we all thought they were cool as hell, but we really didn't need them. Why spend the money? We had something that for the moment already worked. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, sometimes if something told more as a story, like we also tried to sell a, a chief hydrogeologist and the idea we should connect everything through the internet and use Wi-Fi. This out of exploration site, far from anywhere. So it was a technical challenge. And, uh, and what we have been doing is walking out to the wells from the nearest road and hooking up a laptop to our equipment out there to take readings. And she listened to all this and she was in charge of not just our exploration area, but the entire, a very large mine, gold mine out there. And she said, she says, well, that's nice, but you know, last time I checked three years ago doing that for the mine, they were talking like we need satellites and it would cost $3 million. For $3 million, I can hire a lot of guys to drive around and pick up trucks. So did you, did you, she end up making a choice or to do it or not? We did not get to have our new technology. You know? Oh, bummer. Because that was the point. It was really cool stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't a good business proposition. It was too much. It was too, it was more than we needed. Why spend money on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If only if it was a few day, a few years later, it probably would have been a lot cheaper to implement that. I bet that exploration site has Wi-Fi all through it by now. That's, yeah. This is like about eight years later. <laughs> probably super fast too. Yeah. So, so what, what type of companies do you think could benefit the most from your technical storytelling? I see it mainly as uh, mid-sized to small companies that uh, are not offering, how can I put it? They're, they're all, they may, all, you often are a product that many people can offer. So it really comes down to telling a story about why are you better than the next guy down that does the exact same thing. And that is not easily explained in terms of uh, percentages or technical specifications, but it's like, what is that experience going to be like? Mm -hmm. If I hire you, what's going to happen? Who's going to call me first? What do you want? Then you need to know to even tell me what you charge me, you know, get, get the ball rolling so they can start thinking about these things. So every step is not a surprise to them, or they may hit a step and go, you know, like step three, just briefly mentioned in the technical story, instead of third phone call and uh, say, you know, this really wouldn't work for us. I don't think we can do it that way, you know, and then you can either negotiate something different, but you want to, you want to get them interested early on by making them feel you're a part of their project. You understand what they're doing. It's, the challenge isn't to them to decide, will your thing work for what their your service or whatever work for them. You'll explain that their, their only decision is the business proposition is it worth it to me? Mm -hmm. So you would have to draw on like real world examples in order to do that typically, right? Like case studies. A, a form of case study, but less formal, I would say, you know, if you look at 
case studies are a lot like, you know, I've had in, in two, to get in two different of my three degrees, I've had different professors point out like reading a journal article. And I uh, said, so, so let me tell you how to write, read a journal article. You don't. <laughs> you, you read the abstract. And if it doesn't sound like it applies to you, you don't, you don't read the rest to see if you've misunderstood. You're done with that. And then when you read it, go, yeah, this could be, maybe you scan the headings to see if there's a section. So that type of writing, if you don't catch people right away or they don't have a very specific vision of what they need, you lose them right away. Mm -hmm. The story, the story pulls you in. So if people are even a little interested, it encourages them to keep moving down the path to get, to get to where they need to be. So it sounds like you incorporate elements of copywriting. So to capture people's attention and that these stories are meant to be read thoroughly, not just skim through. Right. It should pull you just like a, just like a good fiction story. It should pull you in. You should, you mm -hmm. know, like, well, that's interesting. I wonder how that works though, you know, so that you keep moving on. It's very much a marketing thing. It's not uh -huh. for technical reports. Yeah. And that's what this podcast is about is just talking about marketing and trying to make it, you know, accessible to people that maybe don't think about this stuff all the time. So I'll tell you literally two days before you contacted me, I, uh, I'd watched a uh, podcast by uh, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And there was a gal on there talking about a gas chromatograph her company made and how it was really great because it's very portable and it just plugs in the wall and you know you can take it out to field sites and if you have a generator you're good but uh so that was interesting so i looked up on uh, linkedin because in my mind i've been thinking what should i be calling myself technical communication uh, business to business communication none of none of it really felt like it caught my what i wanted not uh, her linkedin profile technical storyteller and just immediately yes that that's what i'm trying to say i'll do i'll tell a story about what you're doing very cool and do you, did she do a good job of making it a, a narrative and, and capturing you your attention yeah she did on the podcast um she's she still links that on her linkedin profile but she's now a uh, product manager <laughs> okay probably a similar thing. It's just a different title. <laughs> she probably now has people that do her technical storytelling for her. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> so that's cool. I'm going to check out that podcast. Maybe you can share the, share the link with me and I'll put it in the description of this video too. So people can check it out if they want. Sure. It's a whole series of, of podcasts by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists called Pivot. And it's basically looking at geologists that are, this is good for any company to think about, looking at other ways to use their skills. Because okay. oil and gas is kind of not needing, not needing a lot of geologists right now. But what mm -hmm. else can these skilled people do? Yeah, I've got a couple friends that were in oil and gas like a year ago. They're no longer are. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around the process of, of writing or technical storytelling and you know, its purpose and how it works. And so if, if you were writing a story to uh, demonstrate a product to somebody, you would certainly really need to understand like what the problems are that your target reader is experiencing, right? Yes, very much about what, what they need to get done. So as soon as they start reading it, they're like, oh yeah, this, they're talking to me. Like that's me. <laughs> you need to be able to, understand really quickly there's an old marketing adage that uh nobody needs a quarter inch drill bit they need a quarter inch hole mm -hmm. and that's kind of the heart of it you know what don't worry about what your product does or your service could do exactly what is it they need to get done address that mm -hmm. yeah and that's a uh... you know do you think that companies in general do a good job of that maybe at least on their website some do some don't. Um, at this point, I think larger companies do a better job of it than smaller companies. And uh, maybe that's because smaller companies get more wrapped around their own problems of how to get their product to do what they want and less thought about uh, what people need to get done with their product. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, I, you know, in larger marketing companies, or marketing companies, larger companies in general, they probably have a marketing department 
And these are people that are only focused on the marketing problem and they're not really as invested as, you know, say like a, a business owner or a family operated business would. Right. Be. Um, and also a family operated business, you know, they probably don't spend that much time thinking about marketing unless they don't have any work going on. And, which isn't where they want to be. <laughs> yeah. And which is like the worst time ever to start thinking about marketing because it usually takes some time to see any results. But I think this, this plays into well into what, to what you're offering these companies, because like you mentioned to me earlier, many of them don't think in terms of a website. They think, well, I talk to people, they talk to people, people have a need. Someone says, Oh, so-and-so does it. I get to work. Mm -hmm. And the thing about a website, they're becoming more common now. People are more likely to immediately do a Google search to see what's available rather than start asking among their friends is their first thing. And it's, it's always out there. If you're a small company, you're absolutely right. They don't have time. They don't really have time to do marketing, but the website's always there doing your marketing for you full time, even when you're not there. Yeah, exactly. It's, and that's where people look first these days to, figure out who you are, what your company does. If you offer solutions to their problems in the right location and all that kind of information. Um, but yeah, so we, we started looking at groundwater companies because I come from a residential construction background. Mm -hmm. And I would say as far as websites and online marketing go, construction's about 10 years ahead of groundwater. The <laughs> groundwater's now just starting to catch up because they didn't really need to before. And a lot of uh, business owners that I've talked to still don't really feel the need because they're busy. They still get a lot of customers through word of mouth and through yellow pages and stuff like that. Whereas in residential construction, those things have faded a lot quicker, I think. Um, but with the way the world is these days, everybody's online all the time. There's a lot less real life communication happening these days. So there's a lot less chances for the typical word of mouth to happen. And so everybody's looking online for all of the answers. And so that's why that's what we do is we're just helping people get online and get set up with the basics and having a good story to tell and being able to clearly demonstrate your, uh, you know, your intended customers problems and the solutions you offer as the right solutions for them is all a website really needs to do besides get found, of course. Um, so that's why I was immediately interested in talking to you because that's a huge part of what we do is how do we, how do we get inside the minds of our, our clients, customers and speak their language and get the point across as quickly and easily as possible. And I think right. that's where your particular skill set comes in. And I think it's a great time to be doing this kind of thing because like I said, groundwater industry as a whole is starting to catch up and it's going to happen really quick. And the companies that are figuring that out first are, you know, really noticing the effects. And a lot of them have very good stories to tell you. You attended one of the national groundwater association conventions and everybody there has, has a story to tell. Um, but those don't get shared out instead the potential customers just see a lot of identical companies. They don't see, any special differentiators between them. And the stories make you have a better feel for the company's attitude towards their clients, you know, what type of things they prefer doing. You know, sometimes you'll see a website that lists all these things that they do, and they're all equal on the list. But on a story, you, you come in, it's like, yeah, we do this and that. But some of the things that come out, they really like doing this, or, you know, or, or this particular service we offer for uh, cleaning corrosion off your screen in the well and stuff like that we're great at that. That's just like our joy because we're so happy because we're so good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And, uh, you know, even as somebody that builds websites, it's hard to uh, not do that sometimes, you know, pre give preferential treatment to one service or another, even if that's really not, doesn't fit with the goals of the business. Um, you know, a lot of people think of a website as, oh, it's just, it's just a website. Like all we need to do is tell people what we do and talk about ourselves and that's it. But like you just pointed out, there's a lot of subtle things that people pick up on. And if somebody looks through three different websites of three different companies, when they're trying to find a service, you know, those 
the one with the best story is going to win most of the time. Right. Unless it's only about price or something like that. But usually yeah. it's not. The people that are the manufacturing gate valves probably have a harder go with this approach than the people offering a service. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but they can still do it and they just have to know who who's buying their stuff and what are they doing with it? Well, and they can emphasize things. They can emphasize uh, their business model rather than their product as much. Everybody's agreed on what the product is. But when you tell stories about stuff, you can also, you know, I, I can think of companies that have a, a good picture in my mind because working out in the middle of nowhere where you're only in phone range in the evening and like 4.30 in the morning. And then you talk to a company and you have something went wrong and you really need to fix it. And you could use it tomorrow, you know, their, their product. They say, oh, we operate out of there all the time. You're talking to me in Salt Lake, but we have a local Elko office. Or we can have a guy drop by your office and leave it by the back door, you know. So if you can offer, you know, and that's typical, but sometimes it's good to emphasize, especially for something like, uh, I haven't done much production water well work. A lot of sampling stuff, drilling wells for sampling and for measuring depth of water. And uh, there's a company here in Denver. I won't give them a free plug. They can hire me. But, <laughs> but they're very good at providing instrumentation in the field quickly. So I could call them up and it's just like, yeah, we'll get it out the door today. And FedEx will have it overnight and you can pick it up at your office tomorrow afternoon. Well, that's, that's a big deal beyond what they're offering. A lot of people could sell, could rent me that same piece of equipment, but I need it now. It's value to me decreases every day, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so it's a real easy choice. Just, I already know they offer this kind of service. I'll just call them first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so both, both examples you just gave were product companies, but the stories were about the service, the customer service. Right. And so by focusing on the experience that people have when dealing with your company, that's how you can sell more of it. That's right. Off, uh, for a lot of things like valves, like we mentioned other things, you're, uh, you're, it's a very standardized product, you know, and you already know what standards you need to meet. Uh, but there's always that service aspect. Can you get it? We, we live in a very fast moving age and especially for people working out in the field, maybe not as remote as I usually did, but even say like a, a home remodeling site, you know, I don't, I don't need it five days from now. Can you drop it off at the site later today? That's a, a big deal. And that's not necessarily what they're selling, but their ability to get it to you in a hurry certain, certainly counts. Mm -hmm. And you'll probably even be willing to pay extra money for that service. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's dozens of lumber yards around here. My family, we have a remodeling company. So, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. And we'll happily pay more for the company for the lumber yard that's willing to drop off the lumber the same day we order it rather than the one that gives us a huge window and you know, yeah. we have no idea what's going on. We're but, sure to have it in stock sometime this year. Yeah. Yeah. And the price is probably going to go up by the time we get it for you. <laughs> Let um, me say something else though about websites and storytelling and, and something we touched on a little bit. Um, I mentioned like emphasizing these particular services and how well you offer things. Uh, when you're doing most of your marketing word of mouth, it goes slow because people don't tell stories about you all the time and they only tell a story about their personal experience with what you did for them. So one advantage to having a website with stories on it is in particular, if you expand your business at all, if you pick up a new service, maybe you haven't done it a lot. Maybe you've only done it once, but it was very successful. If you put that as a story on the website, anybody coming by can see that and say, well, you know, that's what I need. But if you're depending on referrals through word of mouth, you know, you may run into somebody at a meeting like a half year later and say, oh yeah, we did this job, you know, some guy you know from previous conventions and stuff that's in the same business and say, oh yeah, we, uh, we did this, you know, like back in January. I was like, wow, I didn't even know you did that kind of stuff. Well, there's your word of mouth. You know, you're doing something new. Your word of mouth people don't even know you offer that service yet. 
Mm-hmm. So doing something with a website gets that out in front of people quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you don't you don't even have to wait for people to come to your website. You can put together these stories, maybe put them on your websites or put them in an email or put it somewhere and you know push it out to people. And you know that's another aspect of marketing um, is putting the message out there and making sure the right people see it. Yeah, and I would emphasize this is the type of thing, storytelling for marketing, that uh, is not limited to one medium. You know, you might adjust the writing on it or the visuals, depending. But the same story, you know, you could you could literally start with a technical case study, and then go back and interview the people that were personally involved to bring out, flesh out some of the details that are not needed for the technical case study to make a story. And then maybe they took some pictures while they were doing that. Well, maybe you could put that out on your website, but you would not necessarily show as many pictures on a printed piece. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's not a single item. It's something you can use in a number of different marketing channels. Yeah. Or that- as everybody seems to do now, except me, and I'm probably not going to change. You can send it out on Twitter with a link. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big, Twitter or myself, but I tell you what I am a huge fan of is Google, uh, Google maps. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost a perfect platform, you know, for one mode of getting out your stories and that's getting customer reviews. And when I, you know, a lot of people, they don't put much thought into how they ask their customers for the review. They just say, Hey, would you leave a review? And you know, some, some companies like water treatment companies are famous for this or infamous for this uh, is they'll have like a thousand reviews, but they're all about the salesman and how great the salesman was and how they showed up on time and they were really knowledgeable and all this stuff. But none of them are about the actual product or the experience that people have actually had using the product. And Google, um, you know, Google maps in particular has made it super easy for customers to tell their story about, whatever you did for them and they can post pictures. I think they can even post videos now. And so, you know, we have a couple uh, reviews on our Google maps listing for the remodeling company that just tell the whole story of the actual people that were there. And one of the things that went wrong and how we fixed it. And they posted a ton of pictures and that one review has brought tons of customers to us and helped them trust us and understand what we can do for them. So that's a huge tip for anybody listening is, you know, focus on getting reviews and put some thought into what you ask for from people, you know, ask them to tell the story of what it was like to work with you. Yeah. The important thing that you said is ask mm-hmm. people are, if people are happy with what happened, they would enjoy telling about it. But if you don't ask, they won't think, well, I should write a letter to thank them for how great they were. It's like, that probably won't happen. You have to be proactive in, in generating those reviews. Yeah. And not just ask for a review, but tell them what to, what to put on it. Right. Other, otherwise they're like, well, I don't know what to say. And then they, I don't know, it was great. You know, that's <laughs> it. it's like, yeah, well, what, well did, did you really enjoy like, you know, the people you worked with? Did, did you have a difficult position you needed to install that in? You liked the way it was modeled or it was easy to get in, you know? Mm-hmm. And on Google in particular, you, you should even tell people they have to click on the stars before they can submit the review because that's, <laughs> that's a common hang up. And, you know, that ties directly into like everything we're talking about. Like what's important for a business is the experience that our customers have when dealing with our business. And even when you're asking for the review, if you help them understand what should be on the review, if you give them really specific instructions on all the buttons they need to click so they don't get confused, that gives them a positive experience and helps them give you what, what you want. (laughs) And, And, you know, we try to do that. Uh, you know, with our customers, but specifically through websites, we look at it like the customer's experience starts the very moment they see you online and they click onto your website. And what is their experience like when, when going through it? Is it easy to navigate? Can they find what they're looking for? Do they see the information they need to see to even know that this is the right thing if they're in the right place? Right. All those kinds of things, you know, all the experience starts really early and a lot of, uh, business owners and managers and stuff. They just think they don't think that far that early into the process. And I recommend that you look at the whole thing from the very second, somebody looks at you, notices who you are to the last interaction they ever have with you and beyond that. Um, 
if you can make any part of that better because in regards to their experience, then your business will be more successful in my opinion. It, when you're a small business or a small faction within a business, you, your time is very valuable. And I know, especially in smaller businesses and, and for a lot of people, me, one of them, though I fight against it all the time, there's a tendency to try to do everything yourself, but is that the best use of your time? And uh, I'll give you a, an example. I was out at a, in Elko, Nevada, and I probably pronounced Nevada wrong. I'm told it's obvious I'm not from Nevada, just by the way I say it. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I'm working with a, another guy. I can't remember what it was he was looking. We needed something. It was, it was like a, a $500 item, which in his mind was the most he felt comfortable spending without calling back to Denver and asking the boss's opinion. And uh, so he's, he's working at night after we're done in the field, researching different companies and looking to see who has the best price and can they get it. And, uh, and uh, he, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. I said, so um, this isn't his name, Joe. I'm going to call him Joe. Heaven forbid he should ever see this podcast. <laughs> and uh, I said, what are you doing? He goes like, well, you know, th they got this here, and this here, but this one like has an extra feature, but it's an extra hundred dollars and this, but I think I can get exactly what we need and it's $50 cheaper here. I said, how long you been doing that? He says, uh, well, I started out about three hours ago. I said, uh, three hours ago and you think you can save $50 on it. You spent $300 of your time and we're, we're contracting for companies that's contracting to the people paying the bills. So the people paying the bills are paying more than $100 an hour for him. So he can find a way to save $50 on it. So we just called a company we already knew that we'd had good luck with and said, do you make these? Yeah, we'll buy one. So, time, so what you're saying is time is valuable. <laughs> time is valuable. So, you know, especially in small businesses, it's more tempting to like, well, I can put my own marketing plan together. Not that there ever's time for that or, you know, or stuff like that. I see people with uh, a lot of service things like, uh, like I once saw, this is unusual. I once saw a lecture at a technical communications convention in Atlanta and the guy ran a marketing firm um, that did, you know, the whole works with graphics and stuff, print, print and TV. And, and he was co-presenting with his lawyer. One of his big messages is, is like, he says, I'm from a background where it's like, the lawyers are evil. They're a waste of your money. He says, I'm here to tell you that's a lie. I cannot tell you how much time I've saved when I just go to the lawyer and instead of me spending five hours, he goes like, well, no, that's not even legal. So don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Bunch of time Boom. saved. Yeah. So people do that in all aspects of their life where they're just like, I can save money by doing this and, and they can't. So it's, it's good if you have a website where you can go there fast and you know, it's always not about price. A lot of times it's what's the experience I'm going to have buying from you, not the price I'm paying. Cause the longer it takes to determine things, the more time you've used and that's money. Yeah, that's exactly right. It always cracks me up when I see, you know, like a line of a hundred people outside of an ice cream shop and they'll wait three hours to get like a $2 ice cream cone. <laughs> and you know, those are, at the moment, they're not realizing that time is, is really the most uh, scarce resource that we have. You know, money's everywhere, but we all have the same amount of time every day. And in business, especially if you're like an owner operator, that couldn't be more true because it's, uh, it's easy to try to take on and do everything on your own, but you can't do that. You know, you don't have enough time and there's definitely going to be certain things you're really good at that if you do spend time on that, your return on investment will be huge. And then there's other things that you're probably just banging your head against the wall and not making any progress where that you could hire someone else and pay them some money, but get that return on investment that you would get if you were really good at it. So I think that's, that's the point you're getting at. And we, we deal with that kind of stuff all the time in our line of work. That, and, and you know, like I say, getting out, I, I heard a good story about the whole idea of what services do you offer. And uh, I used to work for a small consulting firm doing mainly hydrogeology for mines. And the, uh, 
it was maybe 50 people total, which the owner already felt was too big. He's kind of think, well, some people leave. I wouldn't mind if this was a smaller deal. So anyway, but he, he had hired the, the operate, former operations manager. We'd both left the company at this point. I was having dinner with him. And he said, so yeah, so we hired this new guy. He's a mo groundwater modeler, you know, and he's really good. And so we were having a meeting with one of our clients about a potential new project. And uh, he says, so in the course of this, the client was listing some problems they had. And this new guy says, well, you know, we should put together a database for you with this type of interface and this and that. And, you know, uh, that sounds like, I think would solve your problem. And, you know, they're going, yeah, that sounds, that sounds really good and all that. And uh, so they take a break and they walk out and the owner's walking over and he's standing with this new guy. He goes, do we know how to do that? <laughs> Because, yeah, so you should also be aware, you know, of, of what you have to offer. You may have, you may have skills available to you through your people that you're not even aware are there because you're, you're, you're a small business owner, you're focused. We do this, but we all, you, even a small business has to take on new people. People leave, be aware, always be aware of what, what add-ons you can, you can offer maybe not for more money, but just maybe just a convenience, something that make your business look more attractive. That's different than what you normally do. So how would you go about figuring out what those things might be? Um, well, talking with former customers is really the best way. Uh, the case, the storytelling, that's what that's all about. In my, in my mind, people think so technical storyteller or technical writer or a lot of these positions, they're thinking they're writing. That's it. It's about the writing. Well, you should be a competent writer. I would certainly recommend that. But it's much more about the listening, calling up, asking a question. Keep your mouth shut till they're done talking. <laughs> Let them tell you about it and find out what's going on. And once again, this is another one of those things that uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of time. And if you're a small business, you're probably better off outsourcing that in some way. And now there are people that specialize in that. Right. And as a small business owner, you'll fall into the same uh, trap any technical people do. You know, you're, you're too involved. You'll miss things when you're asking people about their experience because in your mind, you already know what their experience looked like. So you're not really paying as much attention or asking for more detail because you kind of already know that, but you don't necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. And as, as somebody who is involved and knows the technical details, you have the curse of knowledge. Like, you know, way more than the listener or the reader probably does. And so that's something to watch out for. Right. I'll, I'll probably get in trouble with a lot of people for saying this, but I've said it before. So what the hell, <laughs> uh, when I finished my degree in geology, uh, based on that experience, people say, you know, people come to me, so, you know, you know, all geology and I, I've been working a little bit and I go like, I recommend getting a bachelor's degree in geology. If that interests you, I, I found it fascinating. I said, but when you leave, I think in that field and many fields, you should be aware all you've really learned is the vocabulary so people can teach you what you need to know. <laughs> because, and that's, I think a lot with, uh, with what I offer, uh, my interests are the geosciences and energy. I've been a member of the petroleum geologists for like 30 years, even though I never actually worked in petroleum, but, uh, you know, I have the vocabulary. I don't, they don't start talking. I mean, like what the, I have no idea what he's saying, you know? It's like, okay, I, I kind of follow this and maybe I can ask a question here and there to clarify it for me. But they don't have to come at me. It's like, you know, so you know there's three types of rock, don't you? <laughs> no, I even know what they are. <laughs> so that, yeah, that puts you in a really unique position to be able to work with these, you know, specialized companies. But you also know how to tell stories and you must be a competent writer if you're going after this. <laughs> I think I am, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing this is most similar to, I would say, uh, inside of a company rather than outside of a company is uh, a technical person will be working on something 
Like I did this a lot while working out in Elko. The boss back in Denver, you know, would say, hey, you know, this. we think they should change over to this new software and everything will go smoother and, you know, it'll, it'll cost this much. And he'll go, okay, that all sounds good. So write that up for me while you're recommending it. So that's, you know, so then I have to go make more of a story because I'm trying to convince someone beyond the person I'm even talking to that this would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I have the technical knowledge to talk to them, but it's not really about technical. It's more about, hey, I'm out here doing this work for you. Here's how it will help me help you. So could your, your writing services be about more than just marketing? Could they be used for internal sales, sure. if you will? There, there, there is, well, what I just mentioned is, is essentially internal marketing, marketing mm -hmm. within your company. But for instance, in sales, you know, there's always, there's a lot of uh, sales material developed from larger companies just for their salespeople to tell them, to make them aware of what companies done, different projects they've been on, just, you know, brief sheets that summarize. And any salesman that you talk to about something at some point, be it, be it out in the mine site in Nevada or in an office, when it's just the two of you, they'll tell you some stories about stuff that they can't put on a website and they can't write down because of legal considerations that there is confidentiality with their client and they can't publish it, but they can tell you in person. And maybe they won't tell you exactly who that client was, but they'll give you a bunch of details that make it pretty clear to you who that client was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether you're large or small, that's an internal function to create sales material to give the salesman stories to tell. So it's every, they're not totally dependent on their personality. And every time you hire a new salesman, your company is new to them. How can you bring them up to speed in a hurry? So if you already have a backlog of, of descriptions of things you've done, that's something they can study before they go out and talk to clients. Yeah, that's a great application that I didn't think of before, but having, it's like a training manual for sales staff, but it could just be a series of stories that are, compelling and interesting enough that when they're read, you know, they capture the imagination and they're fun to, to repeat. Right. They're sick in people's minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's, I see that as something super valuable for a lot of companies in any industry, but in particular, this one, if you have to hire, if you have a sales team that's got more than one or two people and you have to hire more, this could be a great way to get people up to speed and give them something to use before they learn every single technical detail about the product. Yeah. And then our, and current people may have to learn new things. I was reading, uh, no reading. Okay. I don't read. I was <laughs> skimming an article in the uh, Waterwell journal this morning about a company that had, had basically started out drilling, but it added and had expanded over time to have an entire chemical lab associated with it we're going ahead and processing their results from their water sampling. And uh, the same salespeople that got started with that company selling drilling services are going to be a little lost about the chemistry side of it. That doesn't mean you necessarily want to hire all new salespeople because they're already know a bunch of people that you deal with. So you may need to bring them up to speed so they can talk better about these new services you're offering. Yeah. Man, that's got my mind racing with all sorts of ideas. <laughs> Welcome to my world where you get started on something. It's just like, what about that and this? And mm -hmm. I go on these AAPG pivot stuff and they bring on, they, uh, they usually run like an hour and a half. They're, they're, they're recorded so other people can see them, but I'm mm -hmm. usually on the live deal. And uh, people, they, they usually have like four presenters that'll talk for like five to 10 minutes each. And then they'll have somebody with a service, a particular service or something they want to sell to just make an outright pitch and then a discussion period. And I can't even make it through two of those before I'm scribbling notes like mad. Like, you know, I've got another screen open with LinkedIn on it so I can see if I can find out more about this person, you know, and where they were before. Yeah, I could see, uh, I could see it being super valuable for any company just to have like a bundle of stories that, you know, they're just, it's like an internal, like everybody at the company, it's just part of like the, the manual. Yeah. Everybody at the company reads them and then everybody uses them for their own purposes. And that might be more useful now that we're more distributed 
whether we're living at home or we're just at different offices rather than all in some central office to have that basic material. You know, you might, mm -hmm. you, it may not have everything you want, but if you have a good story about something, if you've written it down, everybody has it. They may say, you know, parts of this are similar to this client I'm pitching. And, and you can call up that person within the company that wrote the story and say, hey, can you give me a little more detail on this part? You know, or how did this work out exactly? Were they mm -hmm. happy about it? You know, an idea I've got for you is training people about storytelling. Because it, so many people in any company could benefit from being able to turn more of the materials or whatever they produce into stories. And that could be something that you offer maybe even as like a blog on your website is, you know, tips for this kind of role telling stories and what it can do for you. It'd be a good way to market for yourself. I, that occurred to me just last night, but I think maybe I should establish this storytelling thing first before I claim to teach it to other people. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, uh, and sometimes stuff you're not good at can be a good thing to concentrate on teaching because you're thinking a lot more about I, I'm terrible at public speaking. So this is a great opportunity for me even to talk to one other person on Zoom, uh -huh. you know, to try and get better at it. And I, I was listening to last night to a guy give a pitch on drones. And it, he, he was a lower level technician that only started the company, you know, been in the company for like a year. So I, I don't, I'm not trying to be hard on the guy. But this was like a, a, a a conversation with everybody about what the company offered and stuff. And he had no real training in the communication aspects of thing. I would say, I would hope he has no training. I would hope this was not the result of training. <laughs> and he immediately launched into slides showing pictures of the drones and their technical specifications. It can fly this high. It has this wingspan and like not much response at all to that. And then later, you know, so instead of leading with that, he should have reversed his presentation or maybe even left that out entirely because then he started talking about some cases they'd done. We went out here, we flew, we measured that. Well, now the chat's starting to fill up. How high can you, how high are you have to be, you know, or how low can you go? And uh, were you able to pick up these magnetic signatures this way? You know, because he was talking about actual stuff they'd done with the drone, but he did not understand that given his presentation. Instead of talking about that, he thought, I'll get out, we'll start out, they want to know the wingspan, what the drone looks like, and like, it's very similar to the quarter inch bit, the quarter inch hole. Nobody wants the drone. They want to know what you can do for them with the drone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That, that could be partially a crux of like English language and just scientific culture as a whole, you know, because we're always trying to, we're trying to talk about facts and always looking at things at a factual basis, but our brains are actually wired to understand things in more of like a narrative fashion. Yes. And that's a perfect example of that is, He's showing stats and stuff and the chat's dead. And then he starts telling stories about what they're doing. And now all of a sudden people are coming yeah. up with questions. Did you do this? Hey, I can do this. Could you help me with it? You know, talk yeah. about sales right there. We're trying yeah. to do this. Is that something you could do? <laughs> yeah. And that's a valuable lesson for all of us. I'm guilty of the same thing. I guarantee if you look at my website, you'll find instances of me just talking about features and stats and facts when I should be telling more of a story. And it's an easy trap to fall into. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's also very hard to tell stories about yourself, which is another good reason to uh, hire somebody to write your web copy or to help with your web design, not the technical back end, though that you should definitely hire someone for. But I mean, also just the layout, what graphics you would like to have, because you're not seeing it with a fresh mind. And, and you get a little panicky. I know writing I, about myself, I get a little panicky. Like, well, what do I look like? Do I really want to say that about myself? Does that really make it clear? And, and it's like, oh, that seems like bragging. You know, what, all stuff that like, if I do it in an in interview format, well, then somebody's asking me the question. So it's perfectly all right to say it. And it comes out naturally. So a lot of times it helps to have someone on the outside do this stuff. Like even there is a four part webcast uh, by Bill Gates early in January, covered a bunch of different topics. And I won't even bother going into that. <laughs> if, you, if you're interested, go on the web, look for Gates notes. But the thing is, he didn't get on there and do a podcast. He got on there 
with a journalist he would hi had hired to help him interview other people and ask questions of both of them. Because that, get, that gave a better podcast all around, having someone from the outside encourage people to talk about things rather than them trying to decide what, what to talk about and how to say mm -hmm. it. Yeah, he's learned that from experience, surely. Uh, I bet, because in my understanding, he started out as a pretty nerdy guy. Yeah, <laughs> there's a video somewhere of all those guys, the Microsoft guys, like dancing on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he wishes that he could delete that one from the internet. <laughs> Well, he helped create the internet, so he's stuck with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he created. Yeah, he's got to live with it. <laughs> no, the it it is true. It's hard to it's hard to talk about yourself sometimes, and it's hard to write about yourself. Um, I've I've encountered this, you know, throughout my ex years of experience building websites for people. I used to ask people if they wanted to write their own content, and half the time they'd be like, "Yeah, I want to write it." And then a month would go by and two months would go by and I would just never get it. And yeah. eventually I would end up having to write it because it's hard to write about yourself. And what we started doing is we'll start off a project doing a zoom call just like this and we'll record it. And I'll just ask, you know, as many questions as I can that I think are relevant. And then it's super easy for them to tell stories and talk about, you know, specific instances that happen that give us, all the information we need to write the content. Cause we know kind of what's gotta be on a website. We know kind of what people are looking for and what, you know, what kind of information they need. Um, right. But the best source for the, the details is the business owner or the, you know, the people that are actually on the ground doing it, whatever it might be. So that's a really long winded way of saying, I agree with it, what you said about that. Well, <laughs> communications, especially I, I, I saw numerous, uh, presentations in college as an undergraduate in geology where they have some guests come in from one place or another and uh, talk about things. Usually some like technical like, oh, we ran these tests on this fault somewhere and, and I was working nights to get through college so I was usually asleep by the time they got anything interesting because it, it was the days of slides and you darken the room. And... Anyway, so I don't remember almost any of those but this one guy came in from... Uh, uh, Amico, Amico oil and gas. They don't exist anymore, but they were, they were big till they weren't. <laughs> and, and I remember he came in to, a, to the class. Uh, the instructor said, can you come in and just talk to the class? Never mind. I know you're going to give a talk tonight, but you know, and sure. And he says, so here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, there were two things I remember from that very clearly. He said, one, he talked about money instead of geoscience says, how does the business end of this look? If you have this great sciencey idea and you think that we should drill a well, wells cost tens of thousands to millions of dollars. You're going to have to convince somebody to give you the money. Who do you have to convince? What are the levels? So that was very interesting. That was people, a tech, people think of that position. He was a geologist was his uh, title as uh, very technical and all that. He's like, business you got to you know you got to know the business you should understand that and the other thing he said near the end was he says 50 he says easily 50 percent of his job was not using the knowledge he had but teaching it to other people so the communication skills are important but they're they're not necessarily easy and it's not for everybody to try and pull that off. Even if you have a good story, you may not be good at telling it. Mm -hmm. And really the only way to get good at it is to practice. Yes. Um, you know, you were saying that public speaking, it might be a challenge for you. Like in this video, you, I wouldn't guess that because you know, you seem cool as a cucumber. Um, but I, I've given a few speeches in front of, you know, a few hundred people. And the first one I did was a lot harder than the last few. And I think it's because I've I've made so many YouTube videos, you know, I've, I've yeah. made like over 50 or probably closer to a hundred now. And at the beginning I was almost as nervous, you know, making a video as I was getting on stage. Cause it's like, Oh man, someone's going to watch this. I hope nobody sees this, you know, all those kinds of thoughts. But after doing it so much, you know, it kind of becomes nothing. And so um, maybe you might think about having a YouTube channel and talking about this stuff. 
Um, it's great practice for public speaking, but also I think the things you talk about are extremely relevant and uh, just talking about storytelling and getting people thinking about turning whatever they know or whatever they're doing and into some sort of story and conveying their message that way can help a lot of people. So I think it's a valuable message. You also need to know occasionally how to tell a story to communicate something quickly. What I'm thinking of is I was out at a, a mine site in Nevada, a very small one that might have been closed for years and they were looking at reopening it. There's like five five guys out there full time, well not full time, but you know, zooming in from Reno, working two weeks and going back. Very, very informal. They bring their dogs with them and they're all laying around outside by the pickup trucks. But anyway, and I'm, I'm an outside consultant. We just come in and do it. I do a very small project. In that case, I was doing a drilling project that was supposed to run like six days and then I'm out of there, you know. And uh, you're not, you're not in contact. At that point, when I was there, we were about five months in. So we actually had one satellite telephone line out for the main guy there and a second one for the contractors. So that was our communication with the outside world. So I walk in and, and there seems to be a bit of a buzz in the room. And uh, the, the chief geologist there that I coordinate with walks over with this woman who does not look happy. And I, you know, and my stuff was going smooth, but they had another project going on that like had not gone smooth. And mine wasn't totally smooth because it was something that needed to be finished in two days. And we only found out it needed to be done at all like the week before. They said, oh, did we mention the regulators, you know, need us to have no, you did not mention that, you know, we need to get out there immediately. But anyway, so he walks up to me, he says, I, I don't, I'm just making up names. This is Lucy Smith. She's the president of the mining company. And she's obviously a very unhappy person. She hasn't enjoyed anything they've been telling her. <laughs> uh -oh. and, and it's just like, so your project, what are you doing? How is that going? <laughs> just with that. Same friendly voice. What are you doing? How is that going? <laughs> and I had to come up with a story real fast because, you know, she's, even though it was this very small operation, you know, she was just like president of an LLC. It's still like, well, she doesn't really want to hear the depth I've drilled to and she doesn't care about that. You know, it's like, how can I get this into the story really quick? <laughs> you know, we got three wells going, one to go. We're going to, we're going to, and then say nothing more about the actual wells at that point. She doesn't care. Skip to what objectives have we fulfilled so far? When will we get the final objectives done? When will we have the report for the regulators telling them the water's not as bad as they thought? <laughs> so storytelling can be long and drawn out, or, but you also need a communication skills to like, when you're wrapped up with all your technical problems and, and the details to be able to very quickly when pressed, you know, condense that into, you know, I had like two minutes to make my case or else I was just going to be another one of the problem people out there to her mind. <laughs> yeah. And you, you quickly thought, okay, what does she care about? Instead right. What's the story? She doesn't want to hear about the depth or she doesn't want to hear about cementing problems. Just like, Mm -hmm. you've got three of the four wells done so there's a good start to a story you need four wells you've already done three of them that's good yeah out. you're Easy. already coming. hey it's great out on my end yeah we're already, <laughs> we're already 75 percent done yeah. like we're almost there i'm gonna be going right in the report by thursday so you're gonna have the stuff you need really quick you know, don't bother telling her, you know, oh, well, we overcame these things and, you know, we brought in our expertise in cementing. Just go with the story, condense it down. Yeah. So there's a, a tidbit of any communication is start off with thinking, you know, what, what is the person I'm talking to care about? Yes. Pretty much any communication you have ever. <laughs> Hopefully you think about that at least most of the time. Well, we touched a lot of, on a lot of that in, portions of this interview talking about writing communications for the salespeople internally rather than outside of it. Mm -hmm. Writing uh, case studies of your product to be sent to the engineers that are going to apply it as opposed to a case study that you would choose and how it would be worded to send to the business managers that have to decide to okay the money. Mm -hmm. Totally different documents about the exact same project. Yeah. And it feeds into sales directly like you know every time i'm trying to make any kind of sale i'm always starting off with you know what are what is this person trying to accomplish and then how 
does what I'm selling fit into that? And telling a story, you're, you're, you're selling an idea basically, or, or a feeling sometimes. Sometimes you're trying to sell a feeling, but in a way you could call most of these kinds of communications sales. And you did that earlier. You said they're internal sales or internal marketing. How right. you it. Marketing project within the company. There's a, there's a book. I will not get, I will not get any money for recommending this book, but anyway, <laughs> Maybe I, you I, will. <laughs> I have a weakness for organizational psychology and business books. There's an author that's written a number of books, uh, Daniel Pink. And one of his books is called, the title is to sell is human. And he makes the case we're all salesmen. We go through our lives trying to sell other people on ideas all the time. Be it parents, their children, children, their parents, up to convincing your congressman to change his policy. Mm -hmm. We're all salesmen. You should understand how sales works because you're going to be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a, a book I read. It's um, what is it? Sell or be sold. I think by Grant Cardone, he said the same exact thing and sales kind of gets a bad rap in a lot of people's minds. Cause they think of like used car salesmen or something like that. Yeah. But he makes the same point as Daniel Pink is that we're all salespeople and children are usually the best at it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because they, there's nothing getting in the way of their mind. They have no preconceived notions. They just know that they want the candy and they got to work mom and dad to get it. And they, and they know their audience better than anybody because <laughs> their life is mainly all studying what mom and dad do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we could look to kids to pick up some sales tips for sure. So um, do you have any other book recommendations about business or storytelling or anything that you want to throw out there? I'm obviously a book fan too, if you look behind me. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I, I don't happen to have the right background for me here. I've got <laughs> scattered all over. Um, boy, there's a bunch of them because I joined a really good book club, uh, The Next Big Idea. And you could look on the web and see some of the stuff they've done. But for specific authors, I would say Adam Grant has written some good stuff. Uh, originals. Uh, he just wrote a book that came out called uh, Think Again. Cool. I haven't heard of that one. Just just came out like in January. Uh, oh. and I can't think. But he's written three or four. Most of these authors I've read like like four or five of their books and I like three or four of them. <laughs> uh -huh. Are you the kind of person that will read five different books or will read one book five times? Somewhere in the middle. Like I've a like I really enjoyed originals, um, and uh, I've gone back to that years later just to review parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, probably probably a very good one for business people to think about. He wrote a he wrote a book, Give and Take. Give and take. And and I'll give you a piece off the very beginning of it to give you a feel for it. The basic idea to see if it'll draw you in or it won't. He, he's looking at, at our interactions, uh, mainly in business, because that's more his focus. And there's a lot of ways you can category people. And for the purpose of the books, he categories them into givers and takers and neutral. He says most people fall into one of these categories. He says not necessarily in everything. You might be a giver in one aspect of your life, a taker in another. But as you can kind of guess, like the takers are like, they go in every situation. What can I get out of this? It's all about what can I benefit from? Mm -hmm. and givers are more the people that like act as mentors you know they spend they spend a lot of time helping other people with their jobs in addition to doing their own and stuff and uh and, and so the book's kind of an indicator how to become a giver without burning out that's an important thing uh -huh. but he starts out he goes like so there's this big study you know we split all these people and he says so he says, you know, a lot of people are in the middle. You know, they're, they want a balance. If somebody gives them something, then they feel they can ask for a take back and forth. He said, and uh, there's a lot of people that are givers. And they, you know, just give incessantly and helping other people out with things. And a lot of them uh, burn out. He says, so when we evaluated all this for the purposes of the study, he says, oh, he said, you know, there's takers. And you, I don't think I need to go into that. You can't probably imagine what a taker is. And uh, he says, so we evaluated based on these three categories, the success people had. He said, so 
no big surprise, the givers, the, some of the least successful people were the givers. They're burned out, they're stretched, they're not even getting their own work done. He said, obviously, the vast majority is in the middle, give and take. Mm -hmm. He says, but here's the thing to think about. When we looked at the most successful people, they were mainly givers also. So it kind of goes in a different direction than you think, because you're thinking like, well, the givers at the bottom. So I guess the takers rule the business world. Yeah. You know, the, givers, the givers rule at that end too. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, five, 10 years ago, I would definitely have thought the takers might be the most successful. And that there's kind of like an attitude in society sometimes that thinks that way. But I've just definitely learned in my own life that the more that I give, the more I get. You know, yeah. It's definitely like a thing. <laughs> so you know, I, I tried, I try to do my best to give as much as I can. And I know it'll come back to me in spades. That sounds like an awesome book. I'm definitely going to check it out. Is that another Adam Grant book? Adam Grant. Okay, cool. Definitely going to check that one out. Um, that reminds me of one of my favorite authors, James Dines. Um, he wrote a book called Mass Psychology. And it's mostly about the stock market and stuff like that. But the okay. first like fifth of the book is about just some like truisms that he's realized throughout his life and that play into you know, your relationship with money and the stock market and stuff. And one of them was one of the biggest things he points out is the paradox. And that's a paradox. You would think that it would be the takers that had the most, but it's yeah. really the givers that end up with the most. And the, and they, you know, the more you take, the, the harder it probably is to get a lot of stuff. Like that's certainly true with money. The harder you chase money, the more it eludes you, kind of like a rabbit or something. Yeah. <laughs> No, you got to do a fair amount of giving, but, but the book deals a lot, you know, after having established these normal categories, it's like, well, so obviously we all want to be givers, but we don't want to be the givers that end up on the failing end of things. Uh -huh. <laughs> so how yeah. do you, how do you give without exhausting yourself? Mm -hmm. Sorry if you hear my dog. I'm just That's a real problem for me because I desperately want a dog and I can't justify it right now. <laughs> Just give me two seconds. I'm going to go let her outside. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more recommendation. This one's fairly new. I, I literally just rolled my chair to the bookshelf next to the, the desk here. You know, so I have, I have think again, right? Sitting there. Nice. But, uh, this one, I really like Range by David Epstein. Range. I haven't heard of that one. What's that right. about? It only came out like last year. And it's why generalists triumph in a specialized world. Huh. Well, that's another counterintuitive one, right? Well, but, you know, you, you've been listening to me now on this is the second call. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the things I've come up with are not because of specialized training I had, but because I've done a lot of different things and been able to bring a lot of different viewpoints to a particular item where everybody already in that field may already have, everything's done this way because that's the way we do it. Mm -hmm. You can arrive from some totally different viewpoint and say, well, you know, over in the pipe manufacturing field, they often do this. And I think that might work for you guys, you know, the pipe yeah. manufacturing. We don't know anything about that. <laughs> I can totally see that. When I got into marketing like about five years ago, the whole, everyone said you have to pick a niche, pick a niche, and you only offer one service. That's the only way. And I started out with web design and then advertising and then SEO and eventually worked my way through all of them because my customers just needed all of them. Yeah. And so eventually we became a company that does all of the services, but our way of making it scale or at least a little bit is by focusing on just a couple industries construction and groundwater um so that's another book that i need to check out it's like where do we get the time to read all these books right so you're so curious i've got a few i'll send you an email later listing a few of you might look them up see if anything catches in mind because there's things like the ceo next door i can't pull that one out in my hand it's sitting downstairs on another bookshelf but <laughs> that totally turned turned my thinking around about ceos mm-hmm because, you know, in my mind, they were like the head of the company and they get a, a, lot, a certain amount of hassle from people like, well, they're mistreating their employees at that company or this or that. 
and it was talking about CEOs of small companies. Like some of them are like, you know, four people realistically and how the president of the company worries about running the company. The CEO, because if you have one, it's usually a, some form of public company to get stock or something. His job is to be totally outward looking at the rest of the world, explaining the value of the company to people that are going to give you the money to do the company. His, it's, running the company has nothing to do with what he does. So it's not really a hierarchy of, you know, low level laborers, management, vice president, president and CEO. The president and the CEO are much closer to about the same because they're doing entirely different functions. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a book called Traction. Have you heard of that? I have heard of that. So they, I, read, I think I read that. They, they talk about the same thing, but they, they just term them different. So like at the top of any company, you've got two people, the visionary, which is the one kind of looking forward and steering where the company's going, what they're doing. But then you have the integrator who's the one that's actually managing everything and making sure everything gets done properly. I'm not, I'm not sure which, which one the CEO would be. <laughs> I guess it just depends on your company and, and oh, your what titles you give to people. But that's a what good kind of CEO they are. Cause I went to a talk by a CEO at uh, university of Colorado. They have a, I won't name the name of the organization, but they organized talks and this guy came in and he, he said he's, he made a lot of money. So, you know, millions of dollars in medical, durable medical equipment. And uh, so he starts off by saying, he goes like, from like the time I was eight, I wanted to be a CEO. And immediately I thought like, that just sounds wrong. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you, by the end of the talk, I thought, this guy's such a total asshole. <laughs> it's like, man. Just all he could think about was, was how powerful he was. And there's, you know, nuts. The, there's, a, there's a thing in that book I've recommended, to Give and Take, early on. Uh, you're probably too young to remember the big Enron crisis from like 25 years ago or something. I, I remember it. I was a kid, though, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the guy that ran Enron was talked about in the book. But he says, you know, so he says, sometimes you could know what's going on. There's, there's big clues. People show who they are. And he picked uh, Enron and he picked, I can't remember the other company, but, you know, not GM, but a really large company, you know, multinational. And pulled out their uh, company reports for a year when, the year when Enron was hot. Uh -huh. And you go in there and you go to the one that isn't Enron. And there's, you know, like, well, you know, there's a letter, a letter from the CEO and there's a page and there's a picture of the CEO up in the corner and there's a letter, you know, we've been doing this and, you know, you go to the Enron one, it's two pages. The second page is a letter from CEO. The first page, the entire page is a picture of the CEO. <laughs> He says, you can see, you see clues like that all the way. The people that are the takers, it's just like, they've got to be center stage. He said, you know, this, you know, it, he didn't even, his letter doesn't even much talk about en Enron so much as how one, the wonderful job he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me wonder, maybe they address it in that book, Give and Take, but I think as a giver, it's easy to recognize takers. But I wonder if it's as easy for takers to recognize givers. What do you think? Uh, takers recognize givers as like patsies, <laughs> people to take advantage of. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but they don't recognize that, that in themselves. They don't see it that way. They don't mm -hmm. think, you know, my thing is to take from everybody so I have it all. Yeah. We're all the heroes of our own stories. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder what's going on in their minds, <laughs> in the minds of someone who wants to be a CEO when they're five. It's you know, it's you know, it funny because I've been to other talks there about other things, including like like a panel discussion among four people that did open a bunch of different businesses. And, and they all talked about it. But this guy, not only that, but it's like he brought his own cheering section. He'd talk and he'd point to people in the audience. <laughs> Frank, isn't that what I said? Remind, I said that, right? You know, and it's just like, you know, it turns out this guy is like the treasurer of the company. It's like, you know, like I'm giving a talk. So you guys need to come and hear me talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, these days, 
you know, there's so many like uh, entrepreneurs these days and everyone's online and everyone's on LinkedIn too. And it's fun to go through and look at people's titles on LinkedIn and see what, what they are. Like, so a lot of people that they're, they're like a one man show, but they're the CEO, you know? Yeah. I've always struggled. Like, what do I, what do I call myself? And I think my title changes every time I open my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> one day uh, I'm yeah, director, I'm one day I'm like, owner. Does that really describe who I am? Yeah. In my mind, I don't tack on the word today, but that's the truth of the matter. Yeah, for sure. It's much easier for me to give cool titles to take the people that work with me. <laughs> my dad always said, though, I remember this, and it seems to be still true after 60 some years. He goes, the longer the title, the less important they are. Yep. <laughs> that's true for sure. <laughs> if, you're, if you're, I shouldn't, I'm thinking of a title I know, but if you're like the... Uh, VP of giving of advanced energy at some university. It's like, that's a lot of title. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I, I donate maybe a couple thousand dollars a year at most to that particular university. And yet I get a personal phone call for an hour. So apparently that may, it's not like says, you know, I'm not that big. And yet this guy's low enough that part of his job is to call someone like me. <laughs> Oh yeah, I guess he's a nice guy. He does a good job, but you know, for, he probably doesn't. Well, maybe he does realize how bad that title is. <laughs> I think sometimes too, those titles are just meant to throw people off. <laughs> like I met, I met someone that works at a big tech company, and they've got a title that's like fifteen words that doesn't at all describe what they do, <laughs> and that's because they don't want anybody to really know what they're doing. So that's kind of interesting. But anyways. Um, Bill, it's been really fun to talk to you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, if people want to know more about what you're doing or get a hold of you, how can they do so? Uh, right now, I'd say go to me on LinkedIn, Bill Sheeb on LinkedIn. All right. And how do you spell Sheeb? S-C-H-I-E-B. Cool. Well, uh, I'll definitely link to your LinkedIn profile from the description of the video. Um, do you have any last parting words for anybody listening to this podcast? Um, well, we're, this is kind of a marketing podcast. I would just say, you know, don't, especially for small businesses, make marketing a part of your business. Don't make, don't make the mistake of thinking just doing your job is enough. You have to let people know about it. That's a great piece of advice and, uh, and wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, maybe we'll do it again sometime. And I look forward to seeing what's coming from you next. All right.